Peacock Angel by E.S. Drower, being some account of votaries of a secret cult and their sanctuaries. Chapter 18, A Place of Infinite Peace. We sought neither paradise nor its harris, but contemplation for its own sake, said Sheikh Adah bin Musafir in Kitab the He Vicar Anafs. So the book for the remembrance of the soul. And I'm going to see if that book exists by itself elsewhere. Ma Kasad no Janan Walla Hauraha Pasad Na Nazaraha Man Ajlaha. I'm not sure exactly. There's no diacritical marks or which language it is, actually. I'm presuming Arabic, but, you know. I woke soon after four o'clock and seeing the sky flushed with rose pink, slipped into a warm coat for mountain air at dawn is sharp and wandered out, stepping softly as I passed the sleepers, rolled in their blankets, round the blackened logs of the evening before. The policeman on watch emerged sleepily from his wrappings, but I silenced him in dumb show, crossed the courtyard, and passed through the arched passageway, which led to the temple court. In this passageway, his mat spread. In one of the recesses slept the wood-carving shake, but he had already risen to perform his devotions. I did not go forward into the courtyard, but climbed on to a small stone platform behind a tree which grew there before the shrine. As on the previous evening, the temple door stood open, and in the blackness of the interior shone the steady yellow flame of an olive oil lamp. Here, as before, stood one of the white ladies, this time the Yacote, praying as the novice had prayed the night before, facing the east, and the lamp within which stood right in the path of the rising sun. At this point, I remembered that, although a wall had told me that a Yazidi must face the sun at every prayer time, the novice, when praying at sunset, had stood in the same place and facing the same direction as her superior at this moment. Whether the lamp symbolized the sun or whether the sanctity of the shrine took precedence here, I did not discover. At dawn, however, the Kiblas were identical, as the temple is oriented like a Christian church, which, indeed, it may once have been, as the abbess prayed and bowed herself at a threshold. A yellow tomcat rubbed himself affectionately against her white robes, arching his back and pressing his head against her. Her movements were precisely the same as those of the novice on the previous evening, and the perambulation of the holy place was the same as she kissed the sacred stones, passing from place to place, the tomcat following in dignity, his tail erect. Now, a lot of the Christian churches and other shrines have gone back and forth. They took them over. And then they were taken over again when power or popularity failed. And as indicated by some of the myths that connect to some of these places being found in a lot of cultures much older than Christianity, um, the idea is probably that maybe the Christians built something on the spot because there is, it looks like much older stuff than, than Christian stuff and even some of these photos. At this hour of dawn, there was absolute silence except for the voices of wild birds, whose burst of song to greet the day was only just heard above the tumble and gush 
of the hurrying waters, I stood very still, half hidden by the mulberry tree, and watched the quiet figure as it moved, unconscious of my presence. Passing from right to left, she kissed, blackened stone after blackened stone, the yellow cat pausing by each like her acolyte. Presently the shake passed, and seeing me there, faced the east, gave me a shy, kind smile. I saw him moving here and there in the forecourt as I returned, kissing the sacred stones in the gray light, for the yellow light which flooded the upper heights had not yet reached us. On the rocks above the guest room, when I had regained it, I saw Fakhar Rashu's little boy, Suleiman, a child of eight, walking uphill, higher up, entirely alone. And pressing his lips to a sacred rock in the same way, the same rapt way as his elders. Now, that's one of the things about the uh, experience of the place. How can you expect to have the experience of the place without the beliefs and the and the lifetime of methodology to the practices associated with it? Well, perhaps not a lifetime, but you know, definitely enough to get used and and you know, all this silent, spontaneous prayer, this unceasing individual reverence, holy places. I cannot help finding more impressive than the massive prayer of organized crowds gathered under roofs to pray, or sing from books, or sermons delivered to half forward congregations, comfortably settled in pews. When I had dressed and walked up the valley, I heard the birds pouring out their morning song in one long continuous gladness, and was well satisfied that I had come to stay at this place at a time when there was no public pilgrimage or feast. Uh, our feast. The factor's wife, who likes gaiety and movement, was eloquent when she described the great autumn feast of assembly when thousands crowd into the valley. The stone, hat, the stone huts are full of pilgrims, male and female, the forecourt full of peddlers, and turned for the time being into the bazaar of a temporary town. She described for me the gaiety that prevails in the courtyards where the debka is danced with linked arms round and round over the gray paving stones. The Yazidi Mir and his sons watching from the platform where the policemen this morning were sleeping. The feast too, I should like of course to see, but I am glad that I came to stay when the shrine was in its normal state of seclusion, I'm glad, too, that I rose early and saw the shrine at its holiest moment of first dawn. For it was then that I became convinced that some Yazidis, inarticulate and vague as they are about their own dogmas and beliefs, possess, to a rare degree, a faculty as sensitive as the antenna of an insect, which makes them conscious of things outside the material. They have the instinct to be still and worship, which is the very essence of religion. And of all holy places I've ever visited during 60 years of life in West and East, this valley of Sheikh Adda, the Mecca of one of the most sorely persecuted and misrepresented peoples in the world, seems to me the loveliest and holiest. Here, one may find the spirit of the Holy Grail, or perhaps rather the glad piety of the saint of Assisi. Something lingers here, unpolluted, eternal, and beautiful. Something as quiet as the soul and as clear-eyed as the spirit. As I sat on the terrace eating breakfast, I saw Deya Kote and the novice returning down the rocky terraces in the bright sunlight with bunches of wild flowers in their hands. Later, I went to visit them bearing a gift of three red-check Australian apples. They did not receive me in their house, but set cushions for me against my temple wall, uh, against the temple wall, just by the black snake. 
and sitting besides me on the paving stones roll themselves cigarettes, for they think it no sin to smoke. I had many questions to ask, but as usual, John's bad interpretership spoil mutual effort. Of course, Islam forbids any intoxicants, so you know the caffeinated beverages um, are even forbidden, and smoking's forbidden. Well, you can fumigate a place, but you don't have drunk plants that you do that with. Our good policeman, when I addressed a question to them, would answer it himself out of his own ignorance, in spite of my ask them or tell them. Their courtesy and goodwill, however, helped our stumbling efforts. Jadon again pressed me to enter the temple, and when I gave the same answer as before, I added, but you go in, Jadon, as it was evident that he wished to do so, but hot tune, he replied, Disconsolately, Fakir will not let me go in again without more karama. In other words, a B. I pushed him over a hundred fields, and he went after the usual ritual of kissing the threshold and stones. Mehmet and her baby joined us, and we sat there quietly. An elder Kurd appeared in the courtyard. His pipe in his hand, the Yakote ordered him, with quiet authority, to remove his shoes before he approached nearer. He obeyed and then seated himself near the temple door after kissing the sacred stones. And he told the Yakote something in an earnest voice, and she replied at some length, I inquired of Mamma the meaning of the conversation. It appeared that a man who was a Muslim was in habit of coming to the shrine of Sheikh Ada for some of the miraculous dust which he put upon a leg in which he had awa here rheumatic pains after every application it seems he felt relief but now he sought fresh advice about the hawa in his stomach stomach ache should he drink tea with this or that food to recarm him the yakote told him that the that, that he should eat lightly and that when he drank tea, it should be weak and not too sweet. And then, if he rubbed his stomach with shake at it, earth and water, by the power of Allah, he would get well. At the return of Jadon, we again tried to converse with the added help of the boy Hacha and Mamet. I asked about water, drunk secondly, and Daya Kota replied that at the times of the year when the Kawals go their rounds, with the sanjak, that is the sacred peacock image, they took with them a certain bowl from Sheikh Adit and gave the faithful water to drink from the bowl. This seemed to hint at a sacramental ceremony, but realizing that without Kurdish or a competent interpreter, I could do little. I rose and said I was going up to the mountain. We will go with you, said Deya Kota, rising with me. So a number of us started up the winding uphill pilgrim path, which passed some shrines. And as well-worn, though rough, soon we branched off to a grass-grown track, which led steeply upwards past outcrops of rock and oaks and the secret terebinths. As we mounted higher and higher, Valleys and hills unrolled themselves below us in increasingly wider panoramas. When we paused at a rocky turn shaded by an overhanging tree, we saw a range of snow mountains rising in their purity behind more lightly covered peaks. Snow, said Dea Kota, pointing them out to me in Kermanji, Kurdish. Bafra. There was a pleasant fiction between us that she was teaching me Kurdish. We perceived below. Like the undulating serpent portrayed on Yazidi shrines, the valley track by which Aziz and his car had labored hither, the Yakota pointed out a Kurdish village below, Mungara, and another 
nesting on the hills a truche. After the rest, we went upward again, the two white ladies leading the way, placidly, never out of breath, for they do nothing else but climb up and down these hills. When the top was reached, we sat and rested again, and viewed the mountains, range on range, and the blue valleys between. The summit of the hill, for although it had been steep climbing, it was not to be dignified with the name of mountains, was covered with dwarf, wind-blown trees, and a quantity of flowers and herbs. We walked to a large flat rock, enclosed by a rough circular wall of stones with two entrances, east and west, both so low that to enter one must crawl. Here, hollowed out by human hands, is a round cistern to receive rainwater. Its sides are concave. Whether it is of ancient or comparatively modern workmanship, it would be difficult to say. In any case, it is sacred. And the Yacopte and the Yarose kiss the entrance and threshold stones and the rock round the cistern. It is probably a Sheikh Shem's shrine, similar to others on mountain tops. The Yacopte bent to collect a few herbs and told me that Yazidi women learn the use of herbs and simple lore, which is transmitted from one generation to another, and that few intelligent women did not know which herbs were purgative and which were febrifuge or which allayed pain. Down we scrambled, this time upon the more westerly face of the hill, meeting the pilgrims away at a higher point, just where a large boulder has been plastered and whitewashed as a sign to pilgrims that from this point they must remove their shoes and go barefoot. At intervals, on our crab-like progress from ledge to ledge, we saw below us the flat, grass-grown temple roof, surmounted by its three white cones and the spires of other shrines rising from the leafy bottom, all miniature in the distance. Haja showed me from a spot from which a Kurdish sharpshooter last spring aimed at the mirror as he was sitting on a roof below. The would-be murderer missed his heart, but wounded the prince in the arm. It seemed an impossibly long shot, for figures seen from here looked the size of flies, so that the Kurd, if Kurd he was, must have been a brilliant marksman. I had heard, however, that the assailant had not been of another faith, but a Yazidi belonging to a faction which resented the mirror's monopoly of the money acquired by the Turs of Sacred Peacock. It is said that few mirrors die in their beds. Now we have five asterisks here, but again, it's page. 75 and others are four or five so I, I don't think it's admitted words i think it's just decoration for some reason back in the guest room i went down to fill a glass from the water which swept past below while the bystander said Awafe, an ejaculation which should always be made when another drinks to convey the wish that his draught may be helpful. The water is cool and delicious. I was resting and reading when the door opened, and in came the two white ladies bearing copper dishes, silvered over and filled with walnuts, almonds, and dried figs. Seeing that I had nothing or with the break, the walnut shells, the abbess went outside and returning with a stone, broke one against the ground. I begged them to stay, and they seated themselves on the stone floor. Cooler, they explained, than the rug, and fingered and twirled their white breads with delicate fingers. I took Deya Kota's bundle of white, roll, of white wool from her and tried to imitate their movements. 
but the thread broke and the spindle did not revolve smoothly as it did for her. So she resumed her work, laughing. Our conversation was halting and difficult still. With Don's help and our mutual goodwill, we came near understanding each other, and I took a photograph of them as they span. Alas, in absent-mindedness later, I spoilt it by taking another on it. I shall never be able to send them the copy I promised so that we can see what we look like, had said innocently these mirrorless white ladies. Understanding was established between us in spite of words, and when they questioned me about my sons and heard that they were soldiers and my daughter, far away, was engaged in war work, they showed me their sympathy, and they said they would pray for their safety, and there was a genuine feeling in their eyes and looks. If I have no photograph of these gracious ladies, so still, so soft of voice, and so spotless of dress, I shall always have a picture of them in my heart. I asked them through Jadon if they had adopted their life by their own wish, or because their families had wished it. By my own wish, answered Dea Pota, smiling wrinkly as she spun, but the novice remained silent. When he rose to go, probably for the midday prayer, I lunched off curds, bread, cheese, and apple, an excellent meal. The light was favorable for a pure Angelus shrine. And when I had taken the photograph to my satisfaction, I wandered uphill with a book to find the right spot for a siesta for the guest room into which the sun poured all day was hot at noon and after I settled myself in the shade of a tree with a rock and my coat for pillow. All around me grew scarlet ranunculus, purple vetch, wild parsley, buttercups, iris, spurge, and a quantity of minute flowers which to me were nameless as I lay there indolently. I could see the spire of Sheikh Shem's white against green on the next hill, its golden balls blinking in the sun. The voice of the water was far enough to make a mere accompaniment, a brushing sound, a continuous murmurous whisper against which I heard blackbirds and heaven knows what. Other birds were their voices mingled in spring symphony with the hum of bees, the blunt-faced bees, as Eucritus called them, were very busy on the perfumed ledge. Their buzz muffled at moments as they crept inside the bell of a flower. A pleasant place. I drowsed and slept. 